Rich has been working in this area for years. And if there's somebody in Michigan who knows where the money is, it's Rich. But I think he'll also tell you that one of the problems is nobody knows where some of the money is. Uh, but I'll let him explain that. But the Michigan Campaign Finance Network does tremendous work in terms uh, of trying to document money in Michigan politics. And if you haven't seen his latest report, it is in the literature room. It's titled this year, Dark Money. Anybody know what dark money means, that term? It's, it's our jargon, but who can tell me what dark money is? We don't know who gave it. We don't know where it came from. It's what the lack of transparency is all about. And um, I, I anticipate that among his comments, Rich is going to explain some of the problems uh, and the realities of dark money. Uh, the procedure we're going to follow is, Rich is going to take about half an hour, then I've asked Jeff Irwin and Ian Vanderwalker, and Ian kind of wave at us. He's second furthest away, New York. Um, are going to give brief five minute commentaries and then we'll do a Q&A. Um, so without anything further, Rich, welcome. My deep gratitude to Stu for organizing all of you and bringing you out today. Uh, I am so happy to see many old friends uh, and probably a lot of new friends. Let me finish the uh, commercial messages here. Uh, try to catch that podcast on the Craig Folly Show where I'm jousting with Craig McCutcheon's counsel. Uh, if you know the state or the uh, program Current State on WKAR, I'll be on there Tuesday with Richard McClellan. And here's the uh, program descending into dark money, the story of uh, money in Michigan politics in 2012. Okay, here we are. Uh, this is the world we live in. And uh, I have to tell you, at this moment, I, I'm in a very dark humor about what's happening and what's happening next. And I probably won't get to what's happening next in the course of my prepared remarks, but ask me a question. So, uh, McCutcheon taking off the aggregate limits of what an individual can give. And the underpinnings of the decision have to do with corruption. So we might celebrate today the end of political corruption because Chief Justice Roberts has defined it away. Uh, in fact, the court says the only corruption is quid pro quo corruption, and that suggests that uh, there'll have to be a contract exposed between the donor and the uh, recipient going to act on the donor's desires. Let me uh, see what I'm doing. Now, I'd like to say a, a word about what this means. And uh, let me use for an example the bully who would be president. <coughs> this guy. <laughs> uh, as Bruce brought up earlier, he's just been to the Sheldon primary. And if you didn't hear what happened with Chris Christie at the Sheldon primary, he made the faux pas of saying occupied territories. And there was an audible gasp in the room. He has uh, since crawled back to Sheldon and apologized for that faux pas. And I understand he has hired Brian Kelly to remove the OT word from all references in the state of New Jersey. The real problem here, one of the real problems on the nature of corruption, is what we're going to see now is joint fundraising committees taken to an all new level. The way we're most familiar with them, the president and the national party committee hold a joint fundraiser. They show up 
you write a check for $70,000, the party is fed, the president's campaign committee is fed. There are different variations on that. Sandy and Carl Levin had a joint fundraising committee. There's nothing inherently wrong about this, but the problem is now, there is no limit on what can be done with these joint fundraising committees. Now, in the past, up to this point in this election cycle, no person could give more than $123,000 to all the federal political committees. That's all the PACs, all the party committees, all three of them for each party, and all the candidates for federal office, U.S. House, U.S. Senate, the presidency. Well, let me give you an illustration using some Michigan names of what this might look like. I'm calling this particular Joint Fundraising Commission uh, Committee the Amash Vacuum Joint Fundraising <laughs> Committee. Uh, it's my understanding that Justin Amash is friends with one of Rich DeVos's grandsons. And so let's take a look at what some of the, the most uh, prolific donors in Michigan politics might do with one of these Joint Fundraising Committees and what uh, Congressman Justin Amash might do with it. Uh, and if you think this is unreasonable or out of scale about what the DeVosses spend in politics, I uh, send you to point page 103 here, the top donors in Michigan state politics. This is well within their means. So, Rich and Helen DeVos give $5,200 to each of 435 candidates of the U.S. House and, 50, and the 33 candidates for the U.S. Senate that's $4.8 million. Dick and Betsy, his oldest son and his wife, give the same. Doug and Maria, the current president of Amway, and his wife do the same. Dan, who owns how many Fox Motors installations around the country, or around the state of Michigan, if you ever see one of those little foxes on the back of a car, those are Dan DeVos dealerships. And his wife, Pam, can give the same. And Sherry DeVos Vanderweede, who I believe is now divorced, can only give one share. So, the DeVos family could give $21.9 million to the Amash Vacuum Committee for candidates. Here we go. But then there's party committees. So there are three federal party committees, the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, and the Republican National Committee, and then they can give $10,000 per year to each state party's federal committee. So in a, in a calendar year, they could give another $5.4 million. In an election cycle, another $10.8 million. But that's not the end of it. What about leadership packs? You've got 233 uh, Republican representatives, 45 senators. Each of them has a leadership pack. You can give each of them $5,000 a year. That's another $12.5 million or $25 million in a two-year election cycle. What does that look like altogether? One envelope, one family, to one aggregator, $40 million over the course of a two-year election cycle, $57.7 million. And my question to you is, is that enough to corrupt? <laughs> Can that make Justin Amash the chairman of a congressional committee? Can that be enough to get a new speaker? You multiply that times the number of families with this kind of wherewithal. This is a wealthy family. This is not the top tier of wealth in America. Uh, shoot, when Terry Land was Secretary of State, I saw her go in the tank over $6,500 in response to a campaign finance complaint I filed. I think uh, $48, $40 million or $57 million in an election cycle is plenty to corrupt. <coughs> Supreme Court of the United States recommends disclosure. As Jocelyn mentioned in her remarks, Part 4 Citizens United was an 8-to-1 decision saying, 
requiring disclosure of the donors to Citizens United, a 501c4 corporation, is constitutionally permissible. Now, the court's not going to do that. The Congress has to do it. Or if we want disclosure in the state of Michigan, the Michigan legislature has to do it. Let's see what the situation looks like now. Since the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2003, BICRA, the McCain-Feingold reforms, this table summarizes candidates and independent spending in United States federal elections. Okay, this is Congress, Senate, presidentials. And what you see generally is the spending is up in presidential years. And what you do notice is after 2006, a Supreme Court case called FEC against Wisconsin Right to Life allowed corporations to do issue advocacy. So the red part of the bar, the independent spending, got a little bit bigger then. In 2010, it tamped down a little bit, even though this was post-Citizens United, and corporations could explicitly tell you, vote for somebody or against somebody. But you see, the red part of the bar got a lot bigger in 2012. This is who the independent spenders are. The green part of the bar is party committees. The yellow part of the bar is non-party committees. And I think you get the message here. The thing went through the roof with the non-party committees in the 2012 election cycle. The political parties are an afterthought. Now, you're, you're going to see commentary now suggesting that McCutcheon is going to lead to the revival of the political parties. Well, remember, these people the donors who have the wherewithal to participate in this way are going to be able to give $200,000 to the th three federal parties in an election cycle. Now, if they want to put $5 million into Americans Pro for Prosperity or $10 million into Crossroads GPS, they can do that too. And they can do so anonymously. I would suggest to you that's more attractive. This, uh, just so if you're keeping score, uh, a little breakdown on the, uh, how that spending has gone. Initially, 2004, which was the 527 era, that was the first response to the McCain-Feingold reforms, that was about people. And there were people who put $20 million into political committees, but we have evolved now into corporations giving. And where things were at a relative state of parity for a long time, in 2012, they got way out of parity. And the conservatives play this game much more heavily than liberals do. Part of that is President Obama's stated antipathy to 501c4's uh, priorities, USA notwithstanding. This is a little representation. This is what the Federal Election Commission knows about who the independent spenders are. The majority of that is super PACs. You remember Mitt Romney refer referred to Restore Our Future as my super PAC. Now, I don't know how that uh, fits with the idea that they're making independent expenditures. You know, was a former campaign apparatchik running Restore Our Future, but yeah, there was big money in there. And, uh, you know, the big money we know about from Sheldon Adelson did go into the, the super PACs. First, he was with Newt Gingrich, then he got with Romney, uh, but he did a lot more than that. I mean, the FEC knows uh, Sheldon Adelson spent $92 million or whatever it was, but people who worked for him talked to the Huffington Post and said, look, he also fed the nonprofits. What he spent was really closer to $150 million, not $90 million. And of course, we know he dropped $2 million into the campaign to defeat the uh, constitutional guarantee of collective bargaining on the Michigan ballot in 2012. Now, the next biggest piece of that pie, going from about 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, are the social welfare organizations, the 501c4s. The little green sliver is unions. The purple up at around 11 o'clock is trade associations, the US Chamber of Commerce. And then you have individuals in that uh, small portion up at, at 11 o'clock. But that's not all that happened. 
Uh, oh, and here are the numbers that go along with that pie. The super PAC, $609 million. C4 is 250 million and the C6 is 55 million. So as far as the Federal Election Commission knows, the relevant 501C organization spent $310 million. That's not even close to what they spent. And I point you to uh, an article Matia Gold wrote in the, in the Washington Post at the early part of this year. The headline in the Post was, uh, Freedom Partners, the Koch Brothers, $400 million secret bank. Now, that doesn't get into Carl Rove's organization, Crossroads GPS. I mean, he had American Crossroads, which was a super PAC. But this isn't close. $310 million is not close to what they spent. And let me illustrate what I mean by that, by this summary from how they bought television in the state of Michigan in the presidential campaign. Yeah, you see below the, the space there, the super PAC spent $10.5 million. The groups above the space are 501c4 organizations. They spent $11.7 million. But only $4 million of that was spent within 60 days of election day. So it was electioneering communications. It had to be reported to the FEC. The other $8 million happened outside the disclosure window. So for the purposes of the FEC, that spending did not exist. Just like the ads you're seeing now from Americans for Prosperity with Julie Boonstra, and the unfortunate young housefrau who's unhappy with what she got from the, the uh, health insurance exchange, those don't exist for the purposes of the Federal Election Commission because they're not within 60 days of an election committee or, or a federal election. Now I ask you, do you think those have anything to do with kneecapping Gary Peters for uh, the election? Yes. Yeah, of course. Do you think what Americans for Prosperity is doing right now in Colorado, in North Carolina, in Arkansas has anything to do? No. They're spending tens of millions of dollars already. It will be hundreds of millions of dollars that will not show up to the Federal Election Commission. And I would submit to you that the nonprofit corporations spent much closer to a billion dollars than they did to 300 million dollars in the 2012 election cycle. It's just that the Federal Election Commission doesn't know a damn thing about it. So, with that happy note, let me uh, switch over to the state of Michigan, which I would maintain to you is the dark money capital of American politics, and that's some doing because I'm telling you, I know all about Crossroads GPS and Americans for Prosperity and Priorities USA and all the rest of it. Proportionally, there is more dark money in the state of Michigan campaigns and elections than there is in federal campaigns and elections. This is the most disgraceful chart I could possibly show to you. This is a history of Michigan Supreme Court election campaigns from 1984 through 2012. <laughs> the blue part of those bars represents money raised and spent by the candidate committees. The red part of the bar represents independent expenditures, mostly by the political parties, that is disclosed to the Bureau of Elections. It's part of our state's campaign finance record. The white part of the bar represents television advertising about the candidates that's not disclosed to the state of Michigan. Now, if it's not disclosed, how do I know how much advertising there was? The broadcasters keep public files, and I've been collecting data from those public files for years. And we got to the point of the greatest disgrace I view in the history of state judicial election campaigns in 2012 with our Supreme Court campaign. The candidates raised and spent $3 million. The political parties, mainly, also right to life, raised and spent $1.7 million. There was another $14 million of unreported television advertising about the candidates. Now, I'm not going to take the time to show you the ads today to illustrate the point, but I'm 
I'll guarantee you, I've got an archive of them on my website, mcfn.org. <coughs> Look at them. There's no mistaking that they are campaign ads. But what they don't do is they don't say vote for or vote elect against a candidate. They merely kneecap them. They really, merely tell you this is a person of no character. This has gotten to the point where in the 2020 or the uh, 2010 election, uh, that was $11 million spent to fill two seats on the Supreme Court. Mary Beth Kelly, who was the top vote getter that year, in a campaign that was driven by television. Otherwise, how do you know anything about Mary Beth Kelly? She didn't buy a television ad of her own, and neither did the Michigan Republican Party report any of the television advertising they spent on her behalf. There is no track whatever. And she wasn't the only one who won a statewide election that year without any, uh, a television-driven campaign without any television advertising <laughs> of her own. Secretary of State Ruth Johnson did. Verge Bernero won a statewide Democratic primary without spending any money of his own for television. And the television that supported him was not disclosed. So, just so you don't have the idea that this only happens in judicial election campaigns, I put together this dashboard. You know, the governor likes dashboards, and so I thought I would give you a dashboard so you could look at this. And basically what this represents is the percentage of each of the statewide election campaigns in 2010 and how much of them was disclosed, how much of it really exists in the public record. The only one where it was appreciably more than half was the Republican gubernatorial primary. And as I'm sure you remember, Rick Snyder self-funded $6 million. That's the bulk of what was disclosed. So, what to do about this? The State Bar of Michigan considered the disgraceful state of Michigan Supreme Court election campaigns and said, look, somebody can argue a case in front of these judges, and perhaps that litigant's opponent in the litigation was the secret funder of $5 million of television advertising that elected the judge that's hearing this case. Now, the United States Supreme Court has said, that is unacceptable. You have a due process right to an impartial court hearing, which means the judge hearing your case has to be demonstrably impartial. Now, the only reason we don't know, if the only reason we don't know is because it's not disclosed, then we need to get the disclosure. And that's exactly what the State Bar of Michigan proposed. Now, immediately after the McCain-Feingold reforms were passed in 2003, Bob LeBrant, who was the political director at the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, went to the Secretary of State, at the time Terry Land, and said, how is this new law going to affect us in the state of Michigan? Considered it and said, you know, the only thing I can do is say, you have to have those words of express advocacy from footnote 42 of Buckley against Vallejo that say, if the words vote for, vote against aren't present, then it's really not a campaign expenditure at all, and you don't have to report it, and the sources that paid for it don't have to be reported either. So that's where the law has been ever since. That was in April 2004. The State Bar said, in view of a lot of things, Wisconsin right to life, this decision I mentioned that let corporate money back into federal elections, gave us a working definition of what authentic issue advocacy is. What it does is try to get move the viewer to contact a public official who can act on a matter of policy. Their counsel, Jim Bob said it's grassroots lobbying. That's what issue advocacy is, it's grassroots lobbying. Well, again, I refer you to the ads themselves. Oh, and they also said it has nothing to do 
with elections, opponents, character and qualifications of the candidates. I, I just invite you to go and look at these ads, and they're all about character assassination. So the language of our statute said, what's a campaign expenditure? If there's clear inference of support or opposition to a candidate, the state bar's reckoning was, the state has an interest in impartial court hearings, which means transparent judicial elections. The, the, the U.S. Supreme Court has stated a preference for disclosure and Citizens United Go back and look at these ads and see if they don't fit within that definition of clear inference of support or opposition. November 13th, I think it was, Secretary of State Ruth Johnson released a statement that said, oh, and, and the State Bar asked only about judicial elections because they're, they can only concern themselves with matters dealing with the legal profession. So, Secretary Johnson answered and said, I can't do this just for judicial election campaigns. I cannot segregate off a segment of elections, but you're absolutely right about this. We're going into an administrative rules process, and we are going to apply the rules of disclosure to all this stuff. I couldn't believe what I was reading at the time. We won something. Now, at that time, that morning, the Senate Elections Commission was, Committee was having a hearing on a bill that was going to double contribution limits to candidates in Michigan state elections. We were one of nine states that did that last year. There's old Alec all over this, all right? This, is, this came from on high. But this is what the Senate Elections Committee was doing with themselves that day. My testimony to them was, wait a minute. 1% of 1% of Michiganders are currently affected by these contribution limits. You mean you're going to raise double the contribution limits? For the sake of one out of 10,000 Michiganders, they politely let me say my piece, called a recess for an hour, and came back with an amendment, and then they passed the bill. Now, sitting in that committee hearing <laughs> with me was Bob LeBrant, former political director of the Chamber of Commerce. He's the one who called that time out. The amendment was to change the definition of a campaign expenditure in the Michigan statute from clear inference of support or opposition to literally Buckley's magic words. Wow. So now the definition of a campaign expenditure is lifted straight out of Buckley. If it doesn't say vote for, vote against, support or defeat, it's not a campaign expenditure. So, Secretary of State Ruth Johnson was stopped cold, right there. That opening had disappeared. Well, that's what they did. They amended the definition. So, that quickly passed through the Senate, passed the Michigan House. All Republican votes, not one Democratic vote. And we got to a point where there was one person who could do something to protect this opportunity to bring disclosure to Michigan campaigns and elections. There he is. There he is. Now, for the benefit of Ian and Ben, who don't know this guy, I'm sure the rest of you have seen him. Uh, this is the governor. And the governor, when he was a candidate, had taken a position on this very issue. This is his campaign platform on uh, ethics in Michigan government. I, I have to read you uh, this, this little segment from his uh, campaign platform. All electioneering communications, broadcast, printed, and telephonic, 
that feature the name or image of a candidate for public office or ballot initiative should be considered expenditures subject to appropriate disclosure requirements. So we had reason for hope. This guy said, there's hope. Now, I love those words because he cribbed them verbatim from this paper I wrote three years before. <laughs> His whole, or his whole ethics platform was cribbed directly from this paper. So I thought, we've got to fight in chance. But he started giving signals. He evolved on his thinking on this issue. Now, this is just my personal thing. When I saw that, it made me think of that. <laughs> No, those of us of a certain age, those of us of a certain age in this room remember fondly the creature from the Black Lagoon. So, that, you know, when he came out of the pool, I thought, I don't know, he's just like the creature from the Black Lagoon. I'm just kidding. Here's how he evolved. He stood in the door, not to protect segregation, but to protect dark money. That is George Wallace at the schoolhouse door, uh, protecting the University of Alabama from integration. And uh, the message from Governor Snyder was dark money today, dark money tomorrow, dark money forever. No one man is as responsible for our predicament, our ugly situation, the fact that the majority of the money spent in our statewide campaigns is off the books with no tracks to the donor than Rick Snyder. That's right. Now, that takes us back to the idea of corruption. And I guess how the governor evolved. The evolution happened quickly. He went native right away. Within 30 days of being sworn into office, he had established a 501c4 committee, the Nerd Fund, that came into the news the other day because Rich Baird, the governor's fixer, had fixed a uh, furniture contract for the governor's cousin George. And the, the question that came up in my mind, how much money did Cousin George give to the Nerd Fund? But we'll never know that, because it will never disclose its donors. And the message is, just trust me. Well, like hell. Transparency is inoculation against corruption. And I would say this, I, I, I'm hopping mad right now. I, I have to tell you that, that these insults, compounded upon insults, have just got me in a state of agitation and a state of wanting war about this stuff. So my message is, any one of those Republicans who voted for uh, Senate Bill 661, which essentially did away with the possibility of uh, transparency in our election campaigns, and the guy who signed that bill into law is PA 252 of 2013, need to be held accountable for what they did. Exactly. Transparency is inoculation against corruption and they guarantee there would be no transparency in Michigan campaigns and elections for the indefinite future. That should be fighting words, people. That should be a campaign platform plot, I would think, but that's just me. So uh, that, that's the extent of my prepared remarks, and uh, I'll defer to Jeff and Ian, and uh, look forward to your questions. Wow, thank you. Rick.